Good evening. My name is Bob Hauser, and I'm the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this virtual public program of the Society. I'm glad you've joined us this evening. The American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the home of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance despite centuries of land theft, removal, and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. Throughout its history, the society has benefited from its residents in this part of Lenape land, now called Philadelphia. We honor the Lenape Peak community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and engagement activities. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Most of our nation's founders were members and the APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which he was either vice president or president of the United States. Like the constitution, the presidency, the Congress and the courts, as a source and keeper of knowledge, the society was an essential piece of the bedrock on which our new nation was founded almost 250 years ago. It remains so today. While we at the society continue to admire Franklin and Jefferson and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the society, and for their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes, we are also much aware of their faults, most significantly their slaveholding. We at the APS are committed to sustaining the better parts of their legacies while working toward a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. That's the APS idea. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have, who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over one and a half million dollars of research and grant, research grants and fellowships each year, primarily to the younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. The society sustains and informs citizenry. We do that through our meetings, influencing the influencers and other activities. For the first time in more than 50 years, the society recently issued a resolution that calls for a broad federal investment in education modeled after the National Defense Education Act of 1958. Although our facilities remain physically closed to all but staff and fellows, we remain committed to serving our founding mission of promoting useful knowledge. Please check the APS website, www.amphilsoch.org, both for new offerings and for links to our archives of earlier presentations. It is now my honor and pleasure, and especially because March is Women's History Month, to introduce Professor Jacqueline Dowd Hall, who will discuss her magnificent prize-winning 2019 book, Sisters and Rebels, A Struggle for the Soul of America. My interest in this story is personal, for one of the principles in the narrative was a 1928 PhD graduate and present day honoree of my former home, the Department of Sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Hall is Julia Cherry Spruill Professor Emeritus at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She was one of the founders of the modern field of women's history and helped to spark a thriving scholarship in Southern labor history and to turn the study of the civil rights movement in new directions. She was awarded a National Humanities Medal for her efforts to deepen the nation's engagement with the humanities 
and I quote, by recording history through the lives of ordinary people and in so doing for making history, end quote. She's past president of the Organization of American Historians and the Southern Historical Association and founding president of the Labor and Working Class History Association. Her books and articles include Revolt Against Chivalry, Jesse Daniel Ames and the Women's Campaign Against Lynching, Like a Family, The Making of a Southern Cotton Mill World, and a most prescient, prescient essay of continuing re relevance, The Long Civil Rights Movement and the Political Uses of the Past, a 2005 paper that challenged the myth that the movement was a short, successful bid to overcome segregation in the Jim Crow South. Professor Hall's latest work, edited with Bruce Baker, is the first publication of Catherine Dupre Lumpkin's Eli Hill, a novel of reconstruction. Professor Hall and her work have won so many awards and prizes that were I to name them all, there'd be no time for this evening's talk. Please remember to enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen for there will be time for questions and note that tonight's talk is closed captioned. Again, note the link at the bottom of your screen. Professor Hall, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Thank you for inviting me uh, and also thank you for that lovely introduction. And thanks, too, to Jessica uh, Frankenfield for organizing this event. So Sisters and Rebels uh, weaves together the stories of three sisters who were born at the end of the 19th century into a former slave-owning family and steeped in devotion to white supremacy and the lost cause. Like the rest of us, they did not get to choose the family and the place they were born into or the beliefs their parents drilled into them, but they did have a choice about how to reckon with that legacy. And this book is about how the ties of sisterhood were tested and frayed as each uh, grappled with her upbringing in her own way. Elizabeth Lumpkin, the oldest, was a celebrated orator on the Confederate Veterans Reunion Circuit and she remained a true believer until the day she died. In the 1920s, Grace Lumpkin became a radical novelist focused on the working women of the South. Catherine Dupree Lumpkin, who is the moral center of the book, she is best known for her classic autobiography, The Making of a Southerner, in which she uh, traced her indoctrination into the culture of white supremacy, and then took her readers step by step through the process by which she unlearned everything she had been raised to believe. Her goal was to remake the South by convincing white Southerners that they could do what she had done. In Sisters and Rebels, I focus on these women's activism and their uh, creative and uh, intellectual work. I, but I don't treat them as isolated individuals. Instead, I show uh, them in implicit, if not literal, conversation with one another and with larger real and imagined communities. And I consider how their lives and work were shaped by their allies, lovers, and friends, the most important of whom figure as major characters in this book, Spiral, spiraling outward from these dense networks. I thread the sisters' lives through almost a century's worth of historical movements, events, and debates. I begin with the myth of the lost cause, this fabricated, alternative reality did not reflect history as it happened. Instead, it romanticized slavery and uh, reconfigured the Civil War, not as a struggle to preserve slavery, but as an effort to uphold 
the principle of states' rights. Through Elizabeth, I show how lost cause advocates stamped their view of Southern history on the white collective memory of the country and did so so successfully that we are fighting about the meaning of the Confederate monuments they erected as we speak. Through Grace's literary offerings, I illuminate the struggles of working women and the work of the writers who tried to represent those struggles. Through Catherine, I lift up uh, an interracial student movement based in, uh, uh, in, in faith-based activism. I also center the left-leaning strand of the women's movement and its effort to strengthen and expand the New Deal. The history-making efforts of Grace, Catherine, and their allies were stymied in the 1950s by the tragic reversals of the Red Scare represented most famously by Joseph McCarthy, but perpetrated by a vast array of governmental and non-governmental actors. McCarthyism, like Trumpism, thrived on chaos and conspiracy theories. By whipping up fears of communist subversion, it turned the sisters pro-labor, pro-civil rights, social democratic ideas and alignments into sinister un-American activities. In the process, it wrecked intimate and long lasting havoc on personal lives and on American political culture. I write in some detail about this tragic denouement, but I end the book at the hopeful open door of the civil rights and women's movements of the 1960s and 70s, which took up many of the causes that the younger Lumpkin sisters had championed. I'll turn now to uh, how I got interested in these women, to how I wrote this book, and to some of the things I learned about the sisters along the way. I first read Catherine's autobiography, The Making of a Southerner, in the early 1970s. I was living in Atlanta, immersed in the city's feminist, anti-war, civil rights counterculture, and trying to write a dissertation at Columbia University in the then brand new field of women's history. Catherine's portrait of the South as a land uh, scarred by slavery, but rich in a history of progressive struggle, resonated with how I saw the region. And I felt a strong connection between my generation of dissenting Southerners and her uh, depression era generation of activist scholars. Still, I was puzzled by the book. I wondered about Catherine's sister, Grace, who also cast off her upbringing and tried to remake the South. She was, in her time, the more famous of the two sisters, yet she doesn't appear in Catherine's autobiography at all. For that matter, what about Catherine herself? This is an autobiography, and yet it ends when she is still in her 20s and in the 1920s, finishing a master's degree at Columbia University and returning to lead an interracial student movement in the segregated South. What about her later life? Uh, what about her doctorate in sociology and labor economics from the University of Wisconsin? Her pursuit of a career as a scholar and a writer at a time when women who aspired to intellectual lives faced soul crushing obstacles. What about the decades she spent outside the South building a vibrant domestic and political life with Dorothy Douglas, a radical economist at Smith College and the former wife of the uh, prominent Democratic Senator Paul Douglas, 
I learned uh, later that in the mid 1920s, Grace had decamped to New York and settled on the uh, Bohemian Lower East Side. She rose to fame with the publication of her first novel, To Make My Bread, about the legendary Gastonia, North Carolina strike of 1929. By the 1930s, she was, as she put it, a warm fellow traveler of the Communist Party. She was also married to her live-in lover, a Jewish immigrant from Eastern Europe, a militant fur and leather worker with literary aspirations. Both she and her husband were uh, deeply, and in Grace's case, fatally involved with Whitaker Chambers, who in the 1920s was known as, quote, the hottest literary Bolshevik in New York, but who went on in the 1950s to become one of the most influential anti-communist writers of his time. As the radical movements of the 1930s and 40s gave way to McCarthyism in the Cold War, uh, Grace, like Whitaker Chambers, reversed course entirely, joining a pack joining a pack of former leftists who uh, gained enormous influence by turning to the right. She spent the last years of her life denouncing her former allies and renouncing her own best work. When I moved to North Carolina in 1973, I uh, jumped at the chance to seek these sisters out. Elizabeth, the eldest, had died a decade earlier, but I found Grace and Catherine in Virginia, to which each had retired uh, separately and and for different reasons. My conversations with them were mesmerizing, but again, as in Catherine's autobiography, there was so much that was left unsaid. And I later learned that both Grace and Catherine, like many non-conforming women in the homophobic Red Scare of the 1950s, had erased wide swaths of their lives from their papers. Catherine, for example, was happy to talk about her conscription into the culture of white supremacy as a child. She was happy to talk about her consciousness raising education at Brunel, an all a small all white girls school in North Georgia, where she encountered the liberating messages of the social gospel and the social sciences for the first time. Most of all, she emphasized the years she spent as Southern student secretary for the National YWCA, when in tandem with an extraordinary group of young black women, she led an interracial student movement in the Jim Crow South. That experience took place in what is often called the Roaring Twenties, an era known for frivolous flappers and anti-black, anti-radical violence. By following these women, however, I came to see the 20s as also laying the groundwork for the left turn that is usually attributed to the sudden shock of the Great Depression, and also for the white student movement and activism of the 1960s. Absent from our conversations, however, was Catherine's long relationship with Dorothy Douglas and and their association with the movements of the 1930s and 40s that made up the left wing of the New Deal. Gone were the years she spent after the appearance in 1946 of the making of a Southerner, when she was cut off from much of her family. Uh, which felt betrayed by her autobiographical revelations. Gone was the shock and terror of McCarthyism. Gone was the startling fact that Grace Lumpkin had named names implicating Catherine and her partner Dorothy in the communist movement and colluding in the storm of red baiting that shattered the lives 
the life they had uh, so carefully built. In order to fill or interrogate these silences, I think it's safe to say that I left no known stone unturned. I returned again and again to those early interviews and interviewed, interviewed their family and friends. I scoured archives and attics for stray letters and plowed through local and organizational records. I dug especially into the papers of Brunel College and the National YWCA. The Brunel papers confirmed the vibrant intellectual culture that Catherine had described, but they also revealed the fact that romantic relationships between women were at the core of that culture. In the decades that followed Catherine's graduation, those friendships were pathologized and stigmatized, ensuring that she would never talk publicly or write publicly about her partnerships with women. For that reason, these exuberant, unselfconscious student records were uh, critical in helping me come to grips with one of the challenges I faced, which was how to write about same-sex partnerships uh, in ways that did not do violence to how my subjects uh, saw themselves and wanted to be seen. A close reading of the records of the YWCA, which was a chief conduit for the social gospel in the South, drove home the point that Christian faith and practice have not always been and do not have to be associated with conservative politics. Those records also gave me an intimate look at the fraught but generative relationships between young black and white women trying to work together in the segregated South in an atmosphere of unequal power relations without models or guides and at a time when in the North as well as in the South, it was almost impossible for them to even find places to meet together. In this search for sources, I had uh, some lucky breaks. A friend of a friend came across a bitter, furious memoir by the sister's father that put him right in the middle of the violent terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War. Uh, a nephew, gave me access to Grace Lumpkin's excruciating late life journals after telling me that he had nothing of interest to share. The current owner of the remarkable home that Catherine shared with her partner welcomed me into the house and its history, which helped me to conjure up the texture of their lives in a way that uh, written sources couldn't do. Perhaps most important, I managed to wrangle my way into possession of hundreds of reports compiled by the FBI, which for decades had surveilled Catherine, Grace, Dorothy, and their friends. It took years of filing Freedom of Information Act requests and suing the Department of Justice. But in the end, the FBI forked over invaluable evidence. It drove me crazy to be so dependent on documents produced by the very red scare that wrecked havoc with the documentary evidence in the first place, leading some of my subjects to burn or bury their papers and leading some of their descendants to refuse to talk to researchers to this day. In the end, however, that tainted archive gave me information and insights without which I could not have written this book. It also alerted me to the dangers of what is now called the surveillance state. From the beginning, I was aware that the history of race, radicalism, and reaction I was writing about spoke to my own times. That's what got me interested in it in the first place. 
but I could not have imagined how explosively resonant that history would turn out to be now in the present moment, both as inspiration and as cautionary tale. I was in the final um, stage of writing Sisters and Rebels as one of the country's most conservative Republican regimes took over all three branches of North Carolina's government. My husband, Bob Korstad and I were involved in the Moral Mondays movement led by the Reverend William Barber, which helped to blunt that takeover. We then watched in horror as Trump ascended to the White House. My book appeared in the spring of 2019. A year later, the pandemic, along with police killings of African Americans, drove home the deadly inequalities built into our economic, medical, and criminal justice systems. Multiracial protests hammered home the message that Black Lives Matter and toppled Confederate monuments in town after town. In response, whites as well as blacks began to think about racism as Catherine Dupree Lumpkin did in her own time, as in her words, a social, economic, psychological complex that can only be dismantled through deep-seated moral and structural change. At the same time, the social democratic ideals that animated the New Deal left with which these women were aligned, again, began gaining traction. These developments exemplify what the great civil rights leader Ella Baker called a, quote, continuity of struggle. Yet I also find myself thinking about the ways in which the resistance to progressive movements regroups and reemerges in new forms. I feel that we are at a crossroads similar to the one that Catherine and her allies faced in the 1940s as they tried to expand the New Deal in the face of McCarthyism. In short, a hopeful progressive movement is up against powerful forces of reaction. In that context, I'm struck more than ever by how history emerges out of and acquires its meaning through a dialogue between the past and the present. As I think about Sisters and Rebels now, I would say that my overarching goal was to reveal a forgotten landscape of possibilities for social justice and to reveal and to show what those, uh, that search for social justice was up against. At the same time, I was pursuing a series of moral, intellectual, political projects inspired by the times I was living through. The first of those projects involved recovering and personalizing progressive struggles that were organic to the South, that involved Blacks and whites, expatriates, as well as people who never left the region. My goal in that recovery is to provide for our times what Grace and Catherine tried to provide for theirs, a usable past for the battles we are fighting in the South, which is now and in some ways always has been a battleground region. The second project that telling these women's stories allowed me to pursue involved joining an, joining an ongoing conversation about how white women in particular can face up and work through a legacy of slavery, segregation, and systemic racism. That legacy has been called our country's original sin. That's a powerful metaphor but it can lead to a fatalistic view that white supremacy is automatically self-renewing. On the contrary, as the Lumpkin sisters' stories show, white supremacy is hard work. It has to be inculcated in children as it was in them. And it has to be deployed over and over again in order to undermine the threat of interracial 
progressive coalitions. As these sister stories also show, white women have been implicated in the mutually reinforcing systems of capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy in complicated ways. Those implications are eloquently explored in Catherine's autobiography. And the aim of my close reading of the making of a Southerner layered with my own research is to drive home the point that white women who today are struggling with issues of complicity and privilege can, as Virginia Woolf famously put it, think back through our mothers. That is, we can learn from women's history. We can see how often women like Elizabeth Lumpkin shored up white supremacy, even as they expanded their own horizons. At the same time, we can find in her younger sisters and their comrades models for how both gender and racial consciousness can be transformed. My third project involved lifting up the left feminist strand of the women's movement and thus challenging the habit of viewing uh, feminism is a single issue movement dominated by the white middle class. The black and white activists who stand in this tradition then and now link women's emancipation to economic and racial justice and infuse feminist consciousness into struggles that do not explicitly prioritize gender equality, especially battles for civil and labor rights and for a strong inclusive safety net. I talked earlier about the YWCA, which stands in this tradition. Here, I want to elaborate a bit more on the role of left feminists in the New Deal coalition. During the Great Depression, these activists did something similar to what the left wing of the Democratic Party is trying to do today. In a time of crisis that made it impossible to ignore the precarity and inequality of American life, they fought to push the New Deal in a uh, social democratic inclusive direction. They did so in part by trying to shift the cost of the safety net onto the wealthiest Americans, the top 1%, and in part by extending the safety net to Blacks of both sexes and marginalized white women, uh, groups that were originally excluded from the New Deal's protections. Catherine Lumpkin, her sister Dorothy Douglas, and their allies were devoted to that effort. And they and their, but they and their ideals occupy a mostly invisible position, even within the scholarship on women and the New Deal. Of course, FDR um, is still the key figure. He still towers over our understanding of this period. But historians have told us a great deal about the so-called maternalist women who staffed the children's and women's bureaus during the 1930s. They've also spotlighted individual, exceptional, exceptional individuals, uh, such as Eleanor Roosevelt, Frances Perkins, and Mary McLeod Bethune. But social change requires both an inside and an outside game. And I think of the women and sisters and rebels as playing a little noticed outside game. They were independent writers and intellectuals who sought to use their expertise to influence public policy directly, but they were equally committed to joining forces with labor unions and grassroots social movements in order to act on a core ideal of the period which was that white collar workers, such as social workers and teachers, should join hands with blue collar, with the blue collar working class, both black and white. That approach, which included both respect for expertise 
and solidarity across class and racial lines speaks directly to our historical moment, a moment when the gig economy is replacing all kinds of jobs uh, so that even universities are dependent on contingent labor, blurring the line between adjunct professors and fast food workers. A moment also in which a pandemic is revealing how we are all uh, at the mercy, if not equally so, of a broken medical system and just-in-time supply chains that are linked to pools of cheap labor in the global South, just as uh, the American economy was uh, dependent on the cheap labor from the US South in the Lumpkin Sisters day. A moment when so much of the workforce is facing conditions that recall the Great Depression, a moment that calls out for bold government actions similar to those that the New Deal left hoped for, but only partially achieved. I'll end uh, with the fourth project this book allowed me to pursue. I said earlier that in writing about the Lumpkin sisters, I wanted to join in the conversation about how to reckon with racism. Likewise, like them, I want to blur the boundary between activism and writing. All three of these sisters believed that human beings are creatures of narrative and that cultural scripts, the stories we tell ourselves about the world are as central to social change as our explicit political maneuvers. Elizabeth, the eldest, believed correctly that it mattered whether white said white Americans across the country bought into the lost cause narrative. Catherine and Grace believed that the counter stories they were telling were political acts. At the core of those counter stories was a challenge to the tendency to view the South as a reservoir of backwardness and reaction that stands as an exception to American innocence and progress. Grace mounted that challenge most powerfully in her first novel, To Make My Bread, in which she put forward a view of the Southern mountains that challenged hillbilly stereotypes that pers persist to this day. Catherine's autobiography challenged the typecasting of the South in even more complex ways. Central to her story of self-transformation was the process of study and experience that allowed her to acquire a new understanding of history, a new narrative of the past. It was only when she learned about the South's history of progressive struggle, especially about moments of interracial coalition, that she could break free from the miseducation of her youth, because it was only then that she could reject her father's equation of Southern identity with devotion to white solidarity and supremacy. She could identify with a different dissident insurgent South instead. In short, she did not have to deny or reject her identity as a white Southerner, a native daughter, in order to devote herself to building a new future for the region and the nation. I also position myself as a native daughter. And I wrote this book in the hope of telling my own counter stories about the South and about women, and thus of taking my place in the continuity of struggle. So uh, thank, I'll end there, and uh, thanks again to uh, Bob, to the American Philosophical Society, and to all of you who tuned in um, for giving me this chance to reflect on this book in the light of the strange and possibility-filled filled circumstances in which we find ourselves. So I'll um, be glad to hear your thoughts and try to address any questions you have.
thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful talk. Let me see if I can get us both so I can see both of us now. Um, and, and so we have the opportunity for questions uh, now. And uh, this is a wonderful talk, a lot about the book, but also a lot about its, uh, its relationship and, and parallels to current events and uh, what should I say, and struggles ongoing and to come. Um, let me start by asking uh, what you think, uh, since you spoke both with Grace and Catherine, I take it at length, uh, what what do you think they would make of of your account, and especially given the fact that you have, in fact, uh, 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 added elements to the narrative that they would not have approved of? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a question I have thought about, but tried not to think about too much. <laughs> um, I honestly think that Catherine would be at least somewhat pleased by having this book out into the world out in the world. I think Grace would be a different story. She was so um, alienated, or at least, well, let me, let me put it this way. In an alternative universe in which Grace had read this, I had written this book and Grace had read this book, which she was in her prime and in her younger years, I think she would have liked it too. But by the time she died and by the time I interviewed her and by the time she died, she was so bitter and so alienated from not only the movements that she had been so dedicated to in her earlier life, but also um, very uh, antagonistic toward the movements that I was involved in and that I valued um, and, and still do value. Right. One, the one other thing, just one other thing I'd say, one of the reasons that, one, that I was so pleased by the opportunity that Bruce Baker, my colleague Bruce Baker and I had to publish Catherine's uh, long languishing novel of reconstruction is that I know for a fact she would have been glad to see that novel published. Right. I just I just got my copy a couple of days ago, so it's still unread, but it will be. Uh, um, the um, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about that that book later on. Did you do you did you think that the sisters had any idea of the kind of long term project that you had in mind that led to this book? When you spoke to them, what did had they had any think? idea that I was going to write a book like this? Yes. Um, Grace did not because I didn't have this idea when I when I interviewed them. But um, Catherine, uh, I became friends with Catherine and I kept up with Catherine. Catherine ended up spending her last years here in Chapel Hill. She retired to a, a long-term living facility here. And so I had the opportunity to talk to her and interview her and also just uh, visit with her uh, over the years uh, until she died in her 80s. And toward, by the time when I decided that I was really gonna try to write this book, I told her that I was gonna try to write this book. Uh -huh. And um, she, um, she didn't say yes, and she didn't say no. <laughs> okay. Uh <laughs> She just looked at me with interest and moved on to another topic. Okay, let me, uh, I have lots of things that interest me, but let me turn to some of the questions that other folks have asked. And this is, this is actually related to one that we spoke about before this, this, uh, th this evening's festivities began. Uh, Susanna Baxendale asks, by any chance, do you know if Patty Boyle 
author of The Desegregated Heart, which influenced by Catherine's autobiography, the similarity of the two women's upbringing and transformation is striking. I don't know for sure, but I, I assume that she was. Uh, I, I really see Catherine's book as the first in what became a very vital um, literary tradition of uh, autobiographies by white Southerners, like, and Boyle's is a perfect example of this, white Southerners uh, trying to come to grips with their own uh, complicity in the racial system. And I feel sure that particularly the women who wrote these, wrote autobiographies after Catherine would have read, would have read her book. Um, I should ask uh, Jennifer, the historian Jennifer Ritterhouse, who uh, wrote the introduction and the, for the republication of Boyle's book, whether she came across anything that would uh, answer that question. Thanks. Um, can you, uh, I guess uh, Susanna Baxendale asked another question, which is, were there family dynamics that fed into Elizabeth's continued allegiance to her father's beliefs uh, and the younger daughter's separation? Oh, definitely. Um, Elizabeth was much older than her younger sister. She was the first uh, born of, um, of the children and she was her father's favorite. She was her father's daughter in every way. I, um, one of the, I, I talked about the uh, lucky and unlucky breaks I had in doing the research for this book, but one lucky and unlucky uh, thing that happened was that after my book had gone to press, I got a telephone call from a niece saying, Jacqueline, I have something that will help you with your book. And it turned out to be papers of Elizabeth that had been in her attic oh. low these many, many decades. Uh -huh. It was too late for my book, but I went through the papers anyway. And one of the things, I already knew this, but one of the things that was so striking was how her father um, acted as her that she was like a stage father her, or her manager and really managed her oratorical career and um, saw it as an extension of, of himself. And then of course, uh, Elizabeth married um, in 1905. And because she, she, she had aspirations to act she was a very ambitious woman, but once she was uh, married and had children, it was simply unthinkable that she could also have a career. So her personal life, the choices uh, that she made in her personal life uh, narrowed her opportunities in a way that uh, Catherine's and Grace's opportunities uh, were, were not. Now, let, let's stay, stay with Elizabeth for a minute. Um, uh, as, as you know, she had children, several, I think, uh, one of whom was the renowned heart surgeon, uh, William Glenn. Uh, did you talk to him as well? Yes. And William Glenn and his wife were tremendously helpful to me in this book. Um, I mentioned these late life uh, journals of Grace's and those journals gave me, given how both sisters had destroyed uh, their, the letters, whatever letters they had exchanged but during, between themselves during the height of their careers. But I had these journals in there that Grace kept in her old age in which she talked in detail about Catherine and how she felt about her, about their meetings and their relationships. And then I also had Catherine's letters written during that period that uh, 
the Glens uh, shared with me. So I had Catherine's point of view as well. Now, um, William was raised by Elizabeth to be uh, uh, also uh, to, 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 what should I say, to sustain the, the, the lost cause uh, in terms of where he was educated and so forth. And yet uh, I take it that he had, must have had a good relationship with, uh, with Catherine because he was the one who first endowed uh, the award in her name at, at the UW-Madison. Yes, he did. He um, and 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 a, a, a good relationship with Grace too. I think he really um, admired his interesting aunts. Um, and you're right. Uh, he he went to uh, the University of the South to Swanee, and right, right. Um, so he's you know the citadel of the lost cause. But uh, as as an adult, um, he, he he was not. Um, a, a believer in the way in the way that his his mother was. And, and another question: uh, Since you just mentioned how much more you learned about Grace, did her views on race uh, change uh, from her more radical days when her overall political beliefs uh, took such a turn? Grace's, yes, they did. She. Uh, was opposed to the Brown decision. She saw the civil rights movement as a communist plot, the whole nine yards. Wow, wow. So that was a, just a, and a complete reversal of her, of her views of the world, yes. Well, you know, her last novel what is called Full Circle. So that gives you some idea what, what about what she was. She and was, it's full of, of racial stereotypes. Yes. Okay. I think there's some questions in the chat box here too, which I have missed. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, here's here's an interesting uh, question, uh, uh, and from someone whose name I can't read uh, completely because of the way the chat function works. But uh, uh, and Elizabeth asks, I'm stuck by how your work in some ways perhaps overlaps with Charles Dew's 2016 book, The Making of a Racist, another Southern and brilliant academic historian reflecting how his upbringing conflicts with his professional training. Uh, what are your thoughts about how we personally address our own heritage? Yes, that, that, that is a, a, a wonderful example of how this, this autobiographical tradition continues. Um, I'm not sure that I exactly understand the question, however. Um, are, are you asking me how uh, about? I guess if you're really raised in this culture of racism and then you get the kind of training that you've had but haven't been made, can, been made that change your commitments. How do you deal with it? I think that's the intent of the question. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, that's exactly the experience that uh, Catherine and, and and Grace had. They both went to this small college that didn't directly challenge their racial views. It was a segregated school, um, and they went there in the years uh, just before and, and during World War One. But it did open them up to uh, new ways of seeing the world, and this, especially via the social gospel and sociology and the social sciences. And through that study and reading, and then uh, they uh, that uh, challenged their racial views along with other experiences that, that they had. Um, I don't think though, I mean, one of the, one of the points that I, that I try to make in this book, people, people who read The Making the Southerner um, often come away sort of summarizing it as, so then Catherine went to New York to Columbia University and there she saw the light, but that is not the way she described it and not, I think not her experience. 
she um, studied with uh, sociologists who were uh, uh, believed in social Darwinism. And in some ways, her education at Columbia was kind of a setback to the enlightenment she had already uh, gotten via her college education and her experience in the YWCA. But luckily for her, while she was in New York, she also came under the influence of the Teachers College and of the YWCA's National Training School. So she got a kind of alternative education via these women-run institutions. Well, I, I recall you also mentioned how she was struck by the, by the uh, miserable conditions of, of, of young white children uh, in, who were neighboring the hard scrabble farm where her family lived at one time. Exactly. She had had experiences as a child that, again, did not, ex did not uh, lead her to explicitly uh, challenge her, her parents' beliefs, but they were experiences that were, opened her to ch the changing consciousness that she would experience later. Okay, and I think we have very little time left, but uh, here's a question. Uh, can you speak more to what you've learned about the surveillance state and what we should be doing about it today? <laughs> um, well, of course, the uh, dealing with the FBI and its uh, surveillance in the, in the 1930s and 40s, was, uh, as I said, a maddening experience. And they, but they were, the things that they were doing at the time were crude, incredibly crude in comparison to the kind of surveillance that is available to all kinds of agencies, including the FBI today. And yet the spirit of what they were doing was, uh, I fear, a spirit that has, uh, has, uh, has, has had a, a, a staying power. They went through people's garbage, they wiretapped uh, their phones, they got hold of their bank records, they uh, questioned their friends and neighbors and colleagues, um, and they documented just every little detail of what these women were doing and writing and supposedly thinking. So just having been sub involved, uh, immersed in that has made me really interested in and watchful about the kinds of things that are going on now. I don't I don't have enough uh, expertise or knowledge to say what we should do today. I wish. Uh, <laughs> how, how early did that kind of surveillance of the sisters begin? you know that began um, in uh, the case of Catherine's partner, Dorothy Douglas, it began in the early 40s, uh -huh. but really um, intensified in the, in the late 40s as the uh, Cold War began and, and McCarthyism um, heated up. All right, well, I think we should close now, but let me ask you one other question. Uh, and that is, um, you know, the, Catherine started out to, to, a, to a large degree, with, what should I say, professing the social gospel. Uh, it was all very Christian. Uh, and my question is, did that really last throughout her life? Uh, did it last? And to what extent was Grace involved in the? In the, in the uh, Grace was involved in that too. Although she was she was not as deeply involved as Catherine was, but uh, Catherine was um, in her later life was a Unitarian. Um, but 
And, and I think she, she was not a religious person in her adult life, but I really do believe that the ideals and the principles and the approach to life and to social change that she learned via liberal Christianity uh, undergirded everything that she did uh, th throughout her life. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for your talk, for that wonderful book. As you know, I just absolutely, have been absolutely uh, uh, entranced by it. Uh, and I urge everybody who hasn't read it yet to go out. I, I find myself looking up one really interesting person from the first half of the last century to another uh, as, I, as, I, as I worked through the pages. Uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. And thank you so much for the, your talk tonight and, and for sharing your other thoughts with us. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.